So how many of you know where the Willis Tower is? Not, not a ton, I know. What if I said the Sears Tower? Yeah, in Chicago, right? That comes to mind. Did you know that the Sears Tower is no longer the Sears Tower? It's now the Willis Tower. You see, in 2009, a large British insurance company became the largest tenant of that building. And part of their deal, their lease agreement, was that they got to name the building. And guess what the name of the insurance company is? Willis. That's right. So they renamed it the Willis Tower. What's funny is if you go up in it in the gift shop, and gee, what a shop. They have a gift shop. Um, they even still have little trinkets that say Sears Tower on them. I noticed they were on clearance, but they still have them. Um, what's interesting about the Willis Tower is on the 103rd floor, they have an observation deck. And we were up there this week. 1,353 feet above the street level. And, and it's, a little, uh, it's a little scary. And what they have there is they have a thing called the ledge. And there are actually, the ledge is, I think, I think there were four, four, there are four glass rooms that stick four feet out from the edge of the building out into nothing. The, the walls, the ceiling, and the floor are glass. And they're, they're rated to hold five tons. So the reality is you can put a whole lot of people in one of those rooms and still not have a problem. But there's something unnerving about... I, I like heights. I am not afraid of heights. But there's something unnerving about being 50, 1,353 feet off the ground and step out onto glass. And what's funny is we would watch people do that. And these big, you know, big hulking he-men guys, and they would walk up and they would sort of... Like they were checking the ice, and then they would walk like this to get out on it. And we saw one person who didn't, didn't clearly didn't pay attention to the fact that the floor was clear because she kind of walked out on it, and then she looked down. She went ah, and she stepped up and off like that. It's it's a little scary. It's like Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. If you remember that movie, and he's there, he's trying to get to where the Holy Grail is, and he's about to make the leap from the lion's head. And he figures out that ultimately it's a leap of faith. It's a step of faith. That's exactly what it is to step out onto the ledge on the Willis Tower. It's a, it's a leap of faith that you have to trust that this thing will hold you. And that's exactly the mindset we're going to look at today is that sense of trust, that leap of faith. We're in the sixth and next to last week of our current series, The Tongue-in-Cheek, Wussification of the Church, based on Leonard Sweet's writings and looks intentionally at the decline of mainline denominations over the last 30 to 40 years, and what we can do about that, how we can be out on the lead of a resurgence in mainline churches. And every week, you know, we've asked a hard question that will help get us to a point where we can be on that leading edge. Reminder, the first week was, what are you looking for? Second week was, do you understand? The third week was, do you want to be made well? The fourth week was, do you want to quit? Last week was, will you lay down your life? And today we ask what, what might be the most interesting and provocative and challenging question of the entire series, which is, will you drink the cup? Will you drink the cup? Now, I did some reading this week, and there are many commonly held sayings, everyday sayings that we use all the time that come from literally drinking the cup. For instance, it was accepted practice in Babylon 4,000 years ago that for a month after a wedding, a full month after a wedding, the bride's father would supply his new son-in-law with all the mead, and mead is a type of honey beer, with all the mead that he could drink. For an entire month, the, the, the bride's father would provide his new son-in-law with all the honey beer he could drink. And it was called Honey Month. Or honeymoon. That's where we get the concept of honeymoon. It puts it in a different context when you know it means that the groom's going to drink for a solid month. Before thermometers were made, brewers used to dip their thumb into the, the brew to figure out the, if it was the right temperature to add the yeast. Because if it was too cold, the yeast wouldn't grow. And if it was too hot, the yeast would die. So sticking their thumb in the beer became known as the rule of thumb. That's where we get that concept. In English pubs, ale was ordered in pints and quarts. 
And when customers would get unruly, the bartender would yell at them to mind their pints and quarts and settle down. Which leads to? Mind your P's and Q's. That's exactly right. Also in England, people who frequented pubs would have a whistle baked into the rim of their ceramic cup. And when they needed a refill, they would blow the whistle. And that led to the phrase, wet your whistle. That's where that comes from. So today we're going to look at a few points about drinking the cup, about being called to service, and how we might answer the question that's at hand today. But I want to start with where does the question even come from? Will you drink the cup? Well, it comes from today's scripture reading, which is found in Matthew chapter 26, beginning at the 36th verse. Here are these words. Then Jesus went with his disciples to the place called Gethsemane. And he said to them, sit here while I go over there and I pray. And so he took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. And then he said to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. And going a little further, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, my father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will. But as you will. And then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to them, Couldn't you men keep watch with me for one hour? <coughs> watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And then he went away a second time and he prayed, My father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. And when he came back, he again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. And so he left them and he went away once more and prayed a third time, saying the same thing. And then he returned to his disciples and he said, are you still sleeping? Look, the hour has come. The Son of Man is delivered into the hands of sinners. Let's go. Rise. Here comes my betrayer. There was a thing written in, seven, and I'm sorry, in 1674. 1674, and it was called The Women's Petition Against Coffee. The Women's Petition Against Coffee. And here's in part what it said, and I quote, Coffee leads men to trifle away their time, scald their chops, spend their money, and then here, I love their description of what coffee is, all for a little base, black, thick, nasty, bitter, stinking, nauseous puddle of water. That's what they thought of coffee. Now, speaking of coffee, have you bought a designer coffee lately? I think they should call it Costa Latte. <laughs> or perhaps Cafe Oleole would be the way to look at that. But reality, in my opinion, a day without coffee is like night. That's how I look at coffee. Are you familiar with Murphy's Law? Anything that can go wrong will go wrong. I found a coffee variation of that. Uh, and it sounds like this. As soon as you pour a fresh hot cup of coffee, your boss will ask you to do something that will last just long enough to make the coffee cold and undrinkable. <laughs> coffee is one of my favorite things. My blood type is Folgers. <laughs> I think even non-coffee drinkers would agree that coffee smells like heaven. I hear people go, I hate coffee, but I love the smell of it. In fact, I'm shocked that women don't want to put a little coffee behind each ear to attract men. I think that would work. And the truth is, if it worked for coffee, I would have no discernible personality whatsoever. <laughs> but given enough coffee, I could rule the world. Today's Palm Sunday. Today's Palm Sunday. We get to wave the palm branches as they did the day that Jesus came into the city. Today's the day we enter Holy Week. We've been preparing for this week for weeks. And today is the day that we begin Holy Week. Today is the day that Jesus rode triumphantly into Jerusalem. The cross ahead, the world behind, and Jesus didn't even falter for a second as he moved forward. He knew where he was going, and he knew what the result would be. Jesus headed into Jerusalem knowing that before him was torture and pain and death on a cross. You see, for Jesus, the cup is the cross. And so he asks us, are you going to take up your cross and follow me? 
Are you willing to drink the cup that is, in fact, the cross? And then we hear that later on that night, he went to pray at the Garden of Gethsemane. And did you notice what he said? He said, Father, if it's possible, may this cup be taken from me. He didn't want to drink the cup of suffering. He didn't want to, but he didn't stop there. We might well have stopped there, but he didn't. Because notice what else he said. He said, yet not as I will, but as you will. And remember, even when he was arrested after that scene, and Peter draws his sword and tries to kill one of the soldiers, and Jesus says, put away your sword. And then he says again, am I not to drink the cup that God has given me? The image of the cup is very important because it's an image of both life and death, an image of suffering. There's a huge bulletin board on the campus of Florida State University. And they use it to advertise all sorts of things. But one time they used it to advertise short-term evening adult education classes. Okay? Short-term evening adult education classes. And in huge, bold headlines, there were two courses that they were advertising right next to each other. Overcoming divorce and how to handle handguns. <laughs> Some things just don't seem to go together well, do they? Like the cup. And the cross. They just don't seem to go together, but they do. Jesus' drinking of the cup is intimately connected to Jesus' death on the cross. Look at it this way Jesus completed at the cross what he began in the upper room, where he promised that he wouldn't drink of the fruit of the vine until he drank it in his restored kingdom. And through his death on the cross, his kingdom comes. And so he drinks the final cup as he enters it on the cross. At the First United Methodist Church of Dallas, Texas, there's at Easter time during the Lenten season, they put up a huge, crude wooden cross out on their lawn. Huge cross, just as this crude, rugged cross. And one day, a couple of years ago, during the Lenten season, a woman called the church and asked to talk to the pastor. And she said, for goodness sake, Reverend, can't you do something with the dreadful cross that's on the front lawn of your church? Turns out she had visited the Dallas Museum of Art, which is right across the street from the church. And it really bothered her. She was bothered by the contrast between the, the beautiful nature of the museum and the ugly nature of the cross. She didn't want to debate the issue. She simply wanted them to take the cross down. Because in her mind, it seemed out of place in this busy, thriving corner of the city. And the reality is she's not alone. It's hard for us to understand why we erect crosses, much less preach about them. We just don't fully comprehend God's purpose in using the cross. And yet for more than 2,000 years, that ugly symbol of execution... Which is really what that is. That's a symbol of execution, a torture device. That ugly symbol has been a focal point for generations of Christians. I think most of us would be unable to completely put into words the meaning of the cross. And so sometimes I think we try to ignore it. And yet, there is something so haunting and so powerful about that cross that we simply cannot set it aside no matter how hard we try. The last week of his earthly life, Jesus was stripped of anything he ever had and he was hung on a cross to die. He shed his own blood for the sake of writing God's poetry on our hearts with a love that is so abounding that it sounds almost too good to be true. But it is true. Jesus chose to die. He chose to die. He could have easily escaped death if he wanted to. He could have walked right through the soldiers who came to arrest him and just gone on his merry way. But he didn't. Instead, he chose to die. And he didn't die on the cross simply to fulfill some Old Testament prophecy. He didn't suffer and die merely to appease an angry deity. Jesus died on the cross to show the extent 
to which God is willing to go to reveal to us just how much we are loved. Amen. And the cross is one of the most dramatic reminders of God's unmerited and undeserved grace. And that's exactly why we call the day of crucifixion Good Friday. So when somebody says to you, why in the world do you Christians call it Good Friday? That's why. Because it reminds us of God's unmerited and undeserved grace. At the cross, we are assured that there is more love in God than there is sin in us. And in the midst of that, it strikes me that people can be so petty, can't they? I mean, you see it all over, and when it happens out there, it may not be such a big deal. We think, ah, that's just the way of the world. But when it happens in the, in the church, it is a big deal. Because we are those who are called to turn the world upside down. And so the church can't afford to be petty. Amen. Which leads us back to this whole concept of the wussification of the church. And I wonder, what is it that's happened to mainline denominational churches in the 21st century? that we turn as many people off as we turn on? Why is it that people have difficulty identifying with the church, with being attracted to the church? There was a man who lived in Appalachia, and he went into the city for the first time in his life. True, this is a true story. I know it sounds like the setup to a joke, but this is a true story. And he saw a fridge. For the first time in his life, he saw a fridge that made its own ice. And he had never seen it before, so he thought it literally a miracle of God that this fridge would make it so nice. And so he returned home, and his church was in the middle of a revival service. And people were giving testimony, so he stood up and he told of the miracle that he had seen of ice being made in the midst of summer by this machine. And a dispute broke out among the people there. And some claimed that there was no such thing, that he was making it up, and others believed him. And as a result, there was a schism in the church. And they split and they formed a new church over that issue. And to this day, the name of the new church is the No Ice in Summer Southern Baptist Church. I kid you not. That's how the church got where it is today. So how do we answer this question? Are we going to drink from the cup of suffering love and selfless service? Are we going to give our lives for others? Or do we avoid the cup? Do we continue with our own selfish pursuits? If you were 30,000 feet up in an airplane and I offered you a parachute, would you jump? What about this then? What if I told you that the plane was on fire and then I offered you a parachute, would you jump? See, appropriate motivation can be a, a huge decision changer, can't it? So what's our motivation? How do we do it? Well, we do it by putting away selfish pursuits and serving others like Jesus does. We shouldn't be afraid to drink of the cup of Jesus. We should be willing to share his life, his suffering, give our lives in service to other people. And I'll be honest, it's not easy. In fact, some days it's really hard and even painful. But it's also always the best thing that we can do with our lives. And we can do it. Because Jesus has gone ahead of us and shown us how to do it. Amen. And he's with us every step of the way as we attempt to do it. You see, when we drink of the cup, we are joining Jesus Christ and accepting God's will for our lives in complete surrender. And as I said, some days that's easy. And some days, not so much. But when we drink from the cup of Jesus Christ, we are saying that we want to share our life with Him. That He's going to live inside of us and that we're going to follow Him no matter what. And we can trust that one day the cup of suffering and difficulty will transform into the cup of blessing and joy and resurrection. Amen. Remember this. Every saint has a past, but every sinner has a future. Would you pray with me? Gracious and loving God, we hear the story 
On the night that you were betrayed, this, this cup is before you, this, this task that you have before you, death on the cross. And we know, we know how difficult that must have been, and we hear it in what you say. Father, if it's possible, take this cup away from me. But we also hear the steadfastness when you say, however, not my will, but your will. So Lord, that's what we ask for in our own lives. We ask not our will, but your will, O oh, Father. We ask that you would help us to put others first. We ask that you would fill us with such a sense of service and commitment that we would willingly drink the cup that is before us, pick up our cross and follow you wherever you would lead us, that we might help transform the world, Lord. For it is in your name that we pray this day and every day. Amen.